wake up America. Well, ISIS is doing a great job of waking up America and the whole world. It's interesting to me that ISIS, good Muslims, doing what Muhammad did, 22 verses in the Quran, command a Muslim to do what Muhammad did. And as you watch ISIS, you're watching what Muhammad did. It's also interesting, too, under the uh, thinking of Muhammad, Muhammad believed that the kafirs, the Arabic for infidels, were not quite human. In fact, not much better than dogs and donkeys. In fact, according to the Quran, many times, for example, they call it Jews, pigs and rats, and things of that nature. But watching ISIS behavior of arrogance against everybody they come up against, doesn't matter who they come up against, as long as they don't believe in exactly what ISIS believes in, they treat them like a dog or a donkey, and they beat them or rape them or kill them. Well, their arrogance, they're actually doing this, as you well know, with video cameras rolling. And so the whole world is seeing how evil these people are. Their arrogance has preceded them and is overtaking their strengths. In fact, their arrogance in beating and raping, beheading, murdering children, women, men, grandmothers, grandfathers, is signaling the rest of the world true Islam. <clears throat> this show today is going to show multiple leaders of the West who are bowing down to Islam and saying lies like jihad is blasphemy against Islam, George W. Bush, um, David Cameron, Prime Minister of the UK is going to say that ISIS is not Islam. And we're going to go through this, and I'm going to do as quick as I can, post it up on YouTube, and we will use this in the future as all of the different Muslim groups. Now, it doesn't matter if it's ISIS, Boko Haram, Abu Sayyaf, Uyghurs, it doesn't matter. They're all using the same playbook, the Quran. And they have completely fooled every one of our leaders in the world who's saying that ISIS is not Islam, Obama. ISIS does not represent Islam. Well, involved in that fooling our leaders is billions and trillions of dollars in cash from Saudi Arabia and all the other Muslim countries who are using ISIS and Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan Muslimin, and all these other groups globally to terrify people who have actually become dogs and donkeys, slaves to Islam. And these leaders have been given cash, and the death knell of every republic is foreign cash, and this cash has turned these leaders that you're going to see into, frankly, slaves and donkeys, just as when Pinocchio went to Pleasure Island for fun, thinking it was cool, he got turned into a slave, a donkey. Let's start with clip, Adam, let's start with clip number two, if name. Fate. I also want to speak tonight directly to Muslims throughout the world. We respect your faith. It's practiced freely by many millions of Americans and by millions more in countries that America counts as friends. Its teachings are good and peaceful. And those who commit evil in the name of Allah blaspheme the name of Allah. The terrorists... Blaspheme the name of Allah. Jihad. <laughs> Jihad is Islam. What did Muhammad do? Jihad. What you see ISIS and all these other guys doing is Jihad. These people are not blaspheme Allah. They are glorifying Allah. When you see the sick things they do, they believe they are glorifying. They believe they are glorifying Allah. Okay, the next clip is just plain, ordinary people, girls in the UK who have converted to Islam. It makes absolutely no sense to me. That would be like before the American Civil War, a black person who's free in the North, which they were, uh, decides to go and walk south of the Mason-Dixon line and turn themselves in to become a slave. 
anybody who converts to Islam from what I have read in the Quran, the good old fashioned Quran, and the Hadith, and the Sunnah, and the Sira, and all that other stuff, basically is committing spiritual suicide. They have a STD, a spiritually transmitted disease, if you will. So, but what I wanted to do was juxtaposition the leaders, the leaders of the world who believe brainwashedly, if that's an adjective, an adverb, that Islam is good. Well, for a fistful of dollars, they're bribed like Judas Iscariot and uh, Benedict Arnold. Okay, so Adam, my good friend, Adam Amariki, Amriki, clip number three. Growing numbers of white British women are converting to Islam. But why would they want to give up all the freedoms their Western life allows? If you're one of these people that enjoy going out clubbing and getting completely rat off, you know, like laying in the curb like four o'clock in the morning with all stuff on your face and stuff, or maybe Islam isn't for you even though you might need it. How easy is it for converts to adapt to a faith where men can marry up to four wives? All my friends know that I'm a co-wife. I've never kept that a secret from anyone. But why are they embracing a faith that some people associate with religious extremism? The way I see it is I'm not a terrorist, and I know that my fiancé, the, the way he is, he's not a terrorist. Unlike the converts, Shana Bukhari was born and brought up a Muslim. I believe in my religion. Being modern doesn't mean I don't believe in God. But she doesn't regularly practice her Muslim faith. She loves all the freedoms her Western life allows. In fact, She's a model. In total contrast, she'll be meeting converts who try to follow Islamic guidelines in everything they do. I want to know why women are converting to Islam. So I'm going to go and meet five converts and try and understand why they've converted to a new religion. She'll find out how Islam's changed their lives and what unexpected difficulties they've had to face. I don't know how converts get married. I really don't. But what might the converts teach Shanna about her own faith? It's interesting. I've been to mosques many, many times in the United States. I always have police or deputy sheriffs there to protect us because the, uh, the adherence to Islam, well, quite frankly, they, they always get violent. It's, uh, it's interesting to me. I, I remember one time in front of a, the mosque where two of the guys who flew into the World Trade Center back on September 11, 2001, I was out there with my group with uh, San Diego um, detectives and uh, police department in uniform. And a guy walks up to me and uh, he says, hey, how can you believe in a God? How can you believe in a God that was on the cross and was crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I said, oh, just so happens this morning when I was reading my Bible, that Psalms 22, that prophecy was written approximately... 750 years before Jesus was hung on the cross, and it was prophecy, and using that psalm that David had written through the inspiration of Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, um, that the uh, inspiration through David would set the stage to fulfill that prophecy. And the Muslim guy was a little surprised, but he said, but the first Bible wasn't written until 1611, which caught me off guard for a few seconds. And I remember chuckling and saying, oh, you're referring to the King James Version of the Bible. He goes, well, that was the first time the Bible was ever written, 1,611 years after Christ. As I switch, I, I replied, um... Perhaps you should talk to your imam. Is he the one who told you that? Yes, he was. And I said, well, the Bible's been around for a long time. In fact, the Old Testament began thousands of years before Jesus was born, and it was all that prophecy, exactly all that prophecy in Isaiah. Was Isaiah 714 that the government would be upon his shoulders and his name would be called Emmanuel and the different prophecies that he would be born of a virgin and all of those different things to which really confused this Muslim fellow. And uh, it was just interesting to me. He was not interested in the truth. He did not want to research it. He didn't want to look at it. And the reason I bring this up, because at that mosque was a number of young girls dressed 
from head to toe, and all you could see were their eyes, and they were clearly born and raised Americans, probably Catholics or Lutherans or Protestants or whatever, but they had converted to Islam. And when they did, when they saw me there, they got really angry. In fact, I would say they were bewitched. Not only that, I might even say in the invisible warfare that we now know and understand, might even say they're demon possessed. And for proof, I bring their own books. I bring their own books from the Hadith, from the Hadith, Hadith Bukhari, volume 7, number 658, and Bukhari, volume 7, number 660. Now, Bukhari is to Islam what the King James Bible is pretty much to the English-speaking world of Christians. And from Bukhari, the leading Hadithist, writer of Hadiths, who's accepted throughout the whole Muslim world, especially Al-Azhar University in Egypt, which is to Islam what the Vatican is to the Roman Catholics. Okay, so here it says Muhammad was bewitched, bewitched from, from, from the Hadith. It says the prophet would be bewitched at times and he would say things that were not true. So not only is he bewitched, which I also understand to be demon-possessed, he would say things that weren't true. He would say that he had sex with all of his wives before his prayers. Well, he had at least 13 wives, so what can I say? Guy didn't need Viagra, I guess. Hey, I'm just... And you know what? Why shouldn't we make fun of it? It is a defense. Self-defense knows no law. And making fun of crazy people, in this case, who are going to cut off your head, rape you, murder you, beat you, which they do to women, as Surah 434 in the good old Quran, if for any reason at all that your wife doesn't want to have sex, let's say she's got an infection or something, hey, we've all married men. I've been married 44 years. I understand this stuff. I got daughters and granddaughters. I understand this stuff. I also understand that when my wife doesn't feel good, I leave her alone. I don't have sex with her when she's not feeling good. But as in, in, in Islam, bewitched, demon-possessed Muhammad in the Quran, 434, said it was okay to beat your wife, to throw her against the wall, to beat her up, and force her to have sex even if she's in enormous pain. Okay, from the Hadith. Narrated Aisha, the girl he married when the girl was six years old. A man called Labid bin Assam from the tribe of Bani Zaraik worked magic, worked magic on Allah's apostle until Allah's apostle, Muhammad, started imagining that he had done a thing that he had not really done. In other words, he was crazy. In the next one, Bukhari, volume 7, number 666, narrated Aisha, the girl that was six years old when he married her, and had, uh, okay, magic was worked on all his apostles so that he used to think that he had sexual relations with all his wives while he actually had not. He was under the effect of magic. That's from their own book. Bukhari, volume 7, number 661, narrated Aisha, the girl that was six years old, when Allah, or Muhammad, mar married her. Magic was worked on Allah's apostles so that he began to imagine that he had done sexual things to his wives, although he hadn't. Okay, so consider that. Compare that to Jesus. What did Jesus do? What did Muhammad do? And frankly... That's my number one tactic and strategy whenever I, I work with anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, non-Muslim who supports Islam. The first thing I do is say, well, why don't you just read the history and the Hadith and the Quran about Muhammad and then compare that to what did Jesus do? And, and quickly you can tell that the Quran is based on a bewitched, demon-possessed man. 
Now, in the class I'm taking through Dr. Bruno, praise God, he has opened my eyes to the difference between invisible warfare and visible warfare, and I'll read some of my stuff that I wrote, and I'm working on more things. really helps me to understand. In fact, when I would go out to mosques with translators, it didn't matter if I said, Jesus loves you, we like you, we enjoy you, hey, we're glad you're here. Very soon, these people would grow volatile and lose their temper. That's why we always had police or deputy sheriffs there to protect us. And they would act as if they were demon-possessed. And I remember going home and telling my wife, you know, no matter how nice we are to these guys, they act like they're demon-possessed. Well, now I understand. They act like they're demon-possessed, bewitched, because they are. Okay. So now back to some of our leaders who believe that Islam is good. Clip number four, clip number Arba. Thank you. It was Islam at places like Uluzar that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. It was innovation in Muslim communities It was innovation in Muslim communities that developed the order of algebra, our magnetic compass and tools of navigation. Are you kidding me? Do you know when algebra was invented by the Greeks? It was 200 BC. Muhammad wasn't born until 570 AD, 770 years. In fact, you can go back. And there are many examples where the Babylonians and the Assyrians in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, the same river valley that Noah, when he came down Mount Ararat, came down into the cradle of civilization. And very quickly, you could go back to, I think it's 1400 BC, 2,200 years before Muhammad was born, they were using algebra. <laughs> it is amazing the lies that are perpetrated like the golden years of Andalusia when the Spaniards conquered, I'm sorry, when the Muslim Moors conquered Spain and they called it the golden years of Andalusia. Well, for the Muslim men who were bewitched and demon-possessed, it was the golden years. It was the golden years for them because they were going around and attacking all the villages, capturing the, you know, the 14, 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 9-year-old girls and raping them. That was golden for the Muslims. <laughs> what did Muhammad do? He married a six-year-old girl, which we have the proof, we have the evidence, we have the facts, we have everything. And he did sexually perverted things to her when she was six years old, when she was nine years old. He actually consummated the marriage. Okay, to me, that's demon-possessed, bewitched. We have that all. I've got it here, and I will come back to that. Okay, so, David Cameron, clip number five, clip number five, Hamsa. David Haynes was a British hero. The fact that an aid worker was taken, held and brutally murdered at the hands of ISIL, sums up what this organization stands for. They are killing and slaughtering thousands of people, Muslims, Christians, minorities across Iraq and Syria. They boast of their brutality. They claim to do this in the name of Islam. That is nonsense. Islam is a religion of peace. They are not. Does anybody out there believe that Islam is the religion of peace who is sane? I'm beginning to wonder about Obama and David Cameron. <laughs> They're watching the same, in fact, they're watching more news than I watch. I watch a lot. I know, I, I, but anybody that could do that at that level of the intelligence briefings that are available to them through CNN <laughs> or whatever and thinks that Islam is peace is crazy. Okay, so here it is from, again, from Bukhari, which is the respect, most respectable of the Hadith. You got the Quran. Quran on top, Hadith, and the Sira, and the Sunnah are the respected documents. Now, it's interesting, as we become more scholarly investigating Islam, and as we find these Hadiths, these different passages in the Hadith, 
and we find the truth, what did Muhammad do? It's interesting to me. Now the Muslim response is, oh, no, 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 that doesn't exist. It's like, really? It's right there. We, you can go online, and you can find these online. The books, the actual books are like this thick. By each one of the guys, there's about a dozen different Muslims who wrote the Hadith. This one here, Bukhari, he is the definitive accepted writer of Hadith. And what he wrote, Bukhari, Volume 5, number 234, narrated Aisha, the six-year-old girl, that Muhammad married. The prophet Muhammad was engaged to me when I was six years old. I was playing on a swing. Wow. I could just see a 56-year-old guy today in California or New York or England walking up to a six-year-old girl and saying, hey, baby, you want to get married while she's sitting on a swing? You think that he might be arrested for being a child molester? Hmm. Okay, so Muhammad's bewitched, demon-possessed. Now we know he's a uh, pedophile. <laughs> it's right out of their own books. In fact, I have fatwas, which is a legal declaration from the highest level of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, stating that Muhammad was doing these weird perverted things to Aisha when she was six. And we have Ayatollah Khomeini. We have him... In, in his own words, he's an expert on Sharia law, Ayatollah Khomeini. We have him in his own words where all night long he raped a four-year-old girl. And when the father of the girl said, why did you rape my daughter who is screaming and crying and begging you not to rape her, four years old, you continued doing it. And Ayatollah Khomeini said, hey, Muhammad had sex with a six-year-old girl, and so it's okay to have sex with a four-year-old girl. In fact, if you investigate it, it gets more perverted. One day old. It's crazy. Okay. All right. So narrated Aisha, the prophet was engaged to me when I was six years old. I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. Unexpectedly, Allah's apostle Muhammad came to me in the afternoon, and my mother handed me over to him at that time. Later on, they consummated the marriage when she was nine years old. I remember being in a uh, dialogue slash debate down in San Diego years ago with a, uh, a Muslim guy, and we were going through this, and I said, well, hey, I said, uh, Muhammad married her when she was six, and at that time, I didn't realize I hadn't learned enough that Muhammad actually had sex with her in a perverted way when she was six years old. So I said, hey, Muhammad married the girl when she was six, waited three years, and then had consummated the marriage with her when she was nine. So the Muslim responded, you see, he waited three years until the girl was nine years old. Well, we had a good laugh at that. The dude was bewitched. Okay, now this next guy clip, this next clip is, this gentleman is now in charge of the CIA. He's a very dangerous man. Um, he believes that Islam is good. He believes that um, we can build a republic based on Islam. In fact, the Constitution of Iraq and the Constitution of Afghanistan, written by the Republicans at the command of George W. Bush, clearly state that Islam is the basis of the law in Iraq and Afghanistan. The flag of Iraq in Arabic says Allah Akbar, and which is, of course, every time they blow themselves up as a suicide bomber, what do they scream? Allah Akbar, God is greatest, Allah Akbar. And also the national anthem of Afghanistan is Allah Akbar. Now, Islam has never permitted a Bill of Rights. Islam has never permitted a First Amendment. Islam has never permitted the foundation of our Constitution, majority rules with minority rights, which is why we fought the Civil War to free the blacks, because you can't have a 7-2 decision by the Supreme Court, Dred Scott, 1857, saying for the greater good, for the greatest number, we're going to enslave the black people to be our machines, two-legged machines. You can't do that. And that goes against the laws of nature where the Spirit of the Lord is. There you will find liberty, 2 Corinthians 3.17. That's why we fought the Civil War. Majority rules, minority rights. You can't have a 51% majority who says black people in the United States are two-legged machines. We're in Nazi Germany. It was a three to two decision by the People's Court that decided Jewish people were legal non-persons. They were less than human beings. The way I started this off with ISIS murdering everybody because they consider us to be lesser than human beings. Dogs or donkeys. And so killing us for them 
is no big deal because that's what Muhammad did. Okay, so this guy is currently the leader of the CIA, and as nicely, nicely as I can say it, I believe, well, he's not all there. Okay, clip number six, clip number six. Our enemy is not terrorism because terrorism is but a tactic. Our enemy is not terror because terror is a state of mind. And as Americans, we refuse to live in fear. Nor do we describe our enemy as jihadists or Islamists because jihad is a holy struggle, a legitimate tenet of Islam. So that is the uh, take from John Brennan. We will hear more from Secretary. Okay, that's brainwashing at the apex, at the zenith. Jihad is fundamental, is basic to Islam. In fact, there's five pillars that they talk about. And from everything, those of us who are scholars who have studied Islam extensively and just watch what Islam does, Jihad is not an inner struggle. It's not some kind of a philosophical debate of good and evil inside her head. No. ISIS is true. What did Muhammad do? And what did Muhammad do? He didn't think. He just killed. He just captured. He just raped. He just beheaded. Some funny stuff. Some funny stuff. I, I have about 7,000 people between Facebook and YouTube and growing rapidly and I average almost 1,500 hits a day with 4,000 emails a day from all over the world. And what I do is a thing that I learned from a very successful Christian evangelist a few years ago who leads still today, even though he's like 85 years old, he leads about 3,000 Muslims a month to Christ by going on chat rooms and debating um, uh, Muslim imams, clerics, pastors, whatever you want to call them. And I remember years ago I asked him, um, Father Zacharias, how do you do this? He's Protestant, even though he's still called Father Zacharias. He says, I tell you, Mr. Steve, you must shock, you must shock the Muslim. I learned that years ago, and I, I use it all the time now. And all of my responses where the Muslims send me many, many notes all the time. I have a lot, maybe two, three hundred imams from Saudi Arabia, and they always send me notes. And I'm very polite and very nice to them. In fact, I'll read one here to you in a few minutes. And I always I thank them for responding to me, and I always respond with, well, according to your holy books, the Quran, the Hadith, the Sirah, and the Sunnah, this is what Muhammad did. And then I show them from the Hadith, or the Quran, the Hadith, the Sirah, and the Sunnah, like um, the Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, Surah 434, where basically, forgive my English, but it says beat the hell out of your wife when she doesn't want to have sex with you, no matter what. I mean, if she's got a uh, yeast infection or an infection, she's in a lot of pain, doesn't matter. If she doesn't want to have sex with the old man, by the Quran itself, he's allowed to beat the hell out of her. And in fact, we've had a couple of cases in the United States, and a lot of cases in the United Kingdom and France, where it's taken to court spousal abuse, and the judge has ruled in favor of the man, the husband, stating that in the religion of Islam, this is what it says. And woman, you married the guy contractually, knowing that he could beat the hell out of you if you didn't want to have sex. So case dismissed, go out there and have some more beatings for foreplay. Okay. So I use funny things, shocking things, like this morning I posted this, and I'm sure I'll have between 1,500 and 2,000 responses, views, tomorrow when I come into my office and look at my computer. According to the Hadith, again, Muslim from this, this guy, instead of Bukhari, this is Muslim, but he's still authoritative. The guy's name is Muslim, volume 3, uh, numbers uh, 5113, 5113. And it's chapter 862. Okay. Non-Muslims have seven intestines, according to this hadith. <laughs> I sent this out this morning, and I got hundreds and hundreds of responses already. So check it out. According to Muhammad, according to Islam, I, as a non-Muslim, have seven intestines. Now, I'm sure if I get sick tomorrow with some kind of a problem with my intestines and I go to a hospital, they're not going to look for seven intestines. They're going to look for one intestine. Okay. 
A believer eats in one intestine, whereas a non-believer eats in seven intestines. A Muslim eats in one intestine, whereas a non-Muslim eats in seven intestines. Ibn Umar reported Allah's messenger Muhammad as saying that a non-Muslim, kafir, infidel, eats in seven intestines, while a Muslim eats in one intestine. Clip number eight. Clip number eight. This is a good guy. This is a good guy. The one, one good guy. Clip number eight. As you listen to the following interview of retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, conducted by WND Radio, please remember that the Obama administration and the Hillary Clinton State Department had a heavy hand in the initiating and continuance of the Arab Spring uprisings and vigorously defended it. What was the result of the Arab Spring? The undeniable empowerment of the Muslim Brotherhood a radical Muslim terrorist organization that has as its main goals the destruction of Israel and the destruction of the United States from within by infiltration techniques. Please also remember that it was Barack Obama himself in his book Audacity of Hope on page 261 who said, quote, I will stand with the Muslims should the political winds shift in an ugly direction, end quote. Do you still believe Okay, pretty crazy stuff. We're going to go to a real crazy guy now. This guy makes a ton of money. I don't know how. But when you hear this, I don't think I have to explain anything. Clip number 16. Clip number 16. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Chris Matthews in Washington, leading off tonight, time to vote. Plus religion and the terrible massacre at Fort Hood. We don't know whether religion played any role in the shootings. All we know is that Nadal Malik Hassan is a Muslim who reportedly was unhappy about his forthcoming deployment to Afghanistan. President Obama said today we don't want to jump to any conclusions. Do Arab Americans or American Muslims have reason to fear a backlash right now also? I guess the noise is so noisy or that, yes. Um, okay, Chris Matthews makes a lot of money, a couple million bucks a year. We don't know if Islam had anything to do. The guys in there, he killed, murdered, what, 23 people? Yelling Allah Akbar. He wore the funerary garments, all white, of a Muslim prepared to die, just as Muhammad Atta did when he flew the airplanes into the World Trade Center. I, I'm trying to figure out how the, all these people now that I'm going down the line, wh wh why do they keep saying that religion had nothing to do with it, Islam is good, jihad is not part of it? Well, you know, it's kind of biblical. Eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear. The problem is it's going to get a lot of people killed. And the real interesting thing is it's, it's really not going to be that many of us in the West, I don't think. I know a lot of you are going, wait, wait, wait. No, look. Even in England and France, they're less than 10%. Here in the United States, 1% to 2% maximum. And frankly, from everything I'm getting, all the intelligence reports I'm getting, when ISIS came out today and said that they're going to start tracking down our military guys who are involved fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, go to their houses and kill them. That came out in the news today. I heard it yesterday. I didn't want to say anything on the show, but I, I got it from authoritative sources today that that is true. And I've had, because of my Marine Corps background, several veterans call me and basically has said, bring it on. Now look, in the United States, as Hillary Clinton said, and for the one time in my life, I agree with Hillary, Hillary Clinton, the American people are armed and dangerous. We are. And praise God that the Second Amendment, First Amendment, that we have these, and we want to be discreet. For example, Southern Poverty Law Center published a big article about me. They're like the ACLU, very powerful. They're worth over $2 billion. 
And they wrote an article, a hit piece on me, and at the very first line, it says, Steve Klein says, I'm ready to shoot back, which is true. I said that. I'm not going to deny it. Think about what I said. I didn't say, I'm ready to do it first. And now, notice, I'm not saying it because I know the media out there will capture that sound bite, take it, and out of context, use it other places, or dub over the top of me. What I said was, I am ready to shoot back. That means self-defense. That's biblical. The commandment, thou shalt not murder, also means thou shalt protect life. If you do not resist a murderer, when he's coming to murder you or someone else, quitasa consentiri vita tour, silence is consent. You're consenting to the murder. You're just as guilty of the murder as the perp. Mm -hmm. So when I said, and I still say, and if I was hauled into a court today, I would say, yes, of course, I'm ready to shoot back. Do you know what's interesting? All the Muslims, the Muslims know me pretty good. And they know what I've done and what I'm capable of doing. You know what? They leave me alone. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. Nehemiah was ready to shoot back. He had a sword. Guess what? He never had to use it. He organized everything in accordance with thou shalt not murder and prepared all of his people exactly as it says in Romans 13, 4, and they were ready. So the sons of the Arabians, along with Sanballat and Tobias, wouldn't attack them. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. Okay, now this is kind of long-winded. At two minutes and two seconds, the leader of the CIA, John Brennan, comes back and repeats how good and wonderful and how much he loves Islam. All right, clip number seven. Clip number seven. Not just on issues of foreign policy, national security, and civil liberties that are of unique concern to you, but across the whole range of issues that affect your lives, as they do all Americans, from economic policy and health care to education, the environment, and faith-based community service. I thank you for working so closely with us. And I'm pleased that we're joined today by two members of our White House Office of Public Engagement who work with you every day, Paul Montero and the ever-popular Kalpin Modi. I join you today as President Obama's principal advisor on homeland security and counterterrorism. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the President's strategy for confronting violent extremism around the world and here at home. And I look forward to an honest and candid discussion about what we can do together to keep our country safe. I also want to thank you on a more personal level for the opportunity to convey my respect for a faith that has helped to shape my own worldview. I grew up in New Jersey, just across the river in West New York in North Bergen of Hudson County. In fact, last night I stayed in Hoboken and woke up this morning to the beautiful view of New York City and the Hudson River, a river that has welcomed countless millions of people over hundreds of years to this great country. I am a product of a Jesuit ed education. Maybe I should say a survivor of a Jesuit education. <laughs> I attended Fordham University up in the Bronx. You know, that's the school up the Bronx that uh, you students from NYU couldn't get into. That's why you had to come here to NYU. <laughs> <laughs> but for more than three decades, I have also had the tremendous fortune to travel the world. And as part of that experience, to learn about the goodness and beauty of Islam. As a college student in the 1970s, I spent a summer traveling through Indonesia, taking in the wonderful landscape, culture, and people of Java and Bali. Despite my long hair, my earring, and my obvious American appearance, I was welcomed throughout that country in a way that is reflect a reflection of the tremendous warmth of Islamic cultures and societies. Like the President during his childhood years in Jakarta, I came to see Islam, not how it is often misrepresented, but for what it is, how it is practiced every day. That audience there, that's the leader of the CIA today, right now, John Brennan. He's the guy that gets all the intel to the U.S. military and all this other stuff. That audience, 100% of that audience, is Muslim 
brotherhood. I recognize face after face after face in that audience. I've been doing this for 13 years now, using all the skills I had as an officer in the Marine Corps, doing intel work and things of that nature. For him to go and address the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan Muslimin, which is the leading edge, intellectual edge of ISIS, Boko Haram, Mujahideen, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, Abu Sayyaf, all of the terrorist groups all operating all around the world under this rule book, the Quran. For a leader of the CIA to go in and address the Muslim Brotherhood, whose logo clearly shows Surah 860 to terrify the infidels to attack them with steeds of war, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, for him to go in there and say that we are misrepresenting Islam and he's talking with the leading edge of the most dangerous part of Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan Banna in 1928 formed it in Egypt. They're outlawed in Egypt for murdering President Anwar Sadat. They're outlawed in Egypt for murdering all of the people, raping all the people because basically they are ISIS. What did Muhammad do? John Brennan. That is very frightening to me, and again, that is why I am ready to shoot back heavily armed, and that's why the Muslims know me. They don't bother me. Okay. Reaching out to the Muslims. You can't just attack them and kill them, self-defense. You've got to try to convert everyone you can. That's why I went to scores and scores of mosques with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and why I do um, Facebook and YouTube today, why I do this TV program. Because if I can shock the Muslims, why do you believe that non-Muslims have seven intestines? That's crazy. That's in their holy book. Why did your prophet marry a six-year-old girl, do perverted sexual things with her when she was six years old, and then consummated the marriage when she's nine years old? Why would you think this guy is anything but a beast, a bewitched pedophile? whose only desire is PMS, power, money, and sex. Okay, so here's, as a result of studying with Dr. Bruno and beginning to understand the depth of spiritual invisible warfare, demons, bewitching, and it was amazing. As soon as I read the stuff that Dr. Bruno gave me in the book that he wrote, The Invisible War, and I knew that Muhammad, um, the, the Hadith, states that he was bewitched. And also, he had the satanic verses. Remember with uh, Salman Rushdie, there's three verses in the Quran that have been taken out where Muhammad was under the influence of Satan. Compare that to Jesus. Jesus obviously was never, even though he was tempted, no. The church in America and Europe is in a frightening and rapid decline during our time. And I see this, a key quote from Dr. Bruno. So... Seeing that, my response to Dr. Bruno is, here's an immediate change in my response to Muslim imams or pastors who follow me on Facebook and YouTube. I know Muhammad acted bewitched, found in the Hadith, Bukhari, which is respected to the Muslims as the King James Bible is to us. Here's a Saudi imam. His name is Syed, Syed, Syed Badar. And Syed will be able to watch this because I will post this to my YouTube Tomorrow, it'll be YouTube number 15, What Did Muhammad Do? And I know they're watching. I know they're watching thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions, given the network, 7,000 friends that I have. And each one of the people that I'm linked up, I have at least 400 major uh, sites, Facebook sites, which exist to expose the insanity of Islam. And each one of them has 5,000 followers, the most you can get. And we're going all over the world all day long. Okay. So I have over 7,000 friends between the two sites, and I use this to expose Muhammad, the demon possessed, compared to what did Jesus do. I do this as a means to witness Luke 19.13, occupy until Jesus Christ returns. Syed Badar wrote back to me, seeing some of the things that I had posted, comparing Jesus to Muhammad, picture of Jesus, picture of the demon-possessed Muhammad. And it says that the Catholic Church is deeply involved 
and sexual children pedophilia abuses. I responded, Sied, glad to see you are watching. Yes, sin is sin. An illegal act by any group is an illegal act. Sied, perhaps the Catholics under the Pope should look to Jesus as the perfect man, God, instead of a flawed man, the Pope. Thanks. As Christians, we can seek a redress by looking to Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus is the perfect man, and his life is the model to follow. Muhammad was demon-possessed, bewitched, a murderer, and a child abuser. Sied, thanks for the notes. Let's get to the real issue, Jesus versus Muhammad. Now, he hasn't responded yet. It's interesting. The imams will last at most two, maybe three times. And I get hundreds of times. And all, all I do is just compare. What did Jesus do? What did Muhammad do? What did Jesus do? What did Muhammad do? What did Jesus do? What did Muhammad do? If they want to argue the Bible, if they want to argue the Quran, I just come back. Hey, look, Jesus is the Bible. Muhammad is the Quran. Let's just compare the two prophets. We were in a huge debate with a number of Saudi Arabians years ago down in San Diego with about 200 people around gathered watching. And that's the tactic that we used. I had Fortunately, a fellow there who spoke Arabic, so the Saudis could really get what I was saying. And then about at least 200 Americans from New Agers, atheists, homosexuals, straight people, young, old, everybody. And all I did was reply back to everything the Saudi Arabians did. What did Jesus do? What did Muhammad do? When they brought up the Crusades, I said, hey, if it was a mistake, we can go back to the Bible, see what would Jesus do, and we can correct it. If it was slavery in America, we can go back to the Bible, look to Jesus, what did Jesus do? But you as Muslims, when you have your crusade called a jihad, or when you go out and rape people and murder people, then where do you go for guidance, ethical guidance? Where do you go? You go to the Quran, you go to the Hadith, you see, oh, Muhammad beheaded men and raped the widow, now brand new widow, 10, 15 feet away from the dead, beheaded husband of a few minutes before in the sand, raping this poor widow who's sobbing, crying, and terrified, or has sex with a six-year-old girl, or, or as Ayatollah Khomeini states in his little green book that having sex with other men and having sex, bestiality, having sex with animals is okay too. We got the proof right there. All right. All right. This one's kind of crazy because I know a lot of you aren't going to like this clip, but here it is. Why would anybody want to dance with people who chop the heads off of other people? The guys... This man, who was, still is, one of the most powerful men in the world, dancing with the Saudi Arabians who cut off the heads, the hands, the legs of people in Saudi Arabia. Clip number 15. Clip number 15, Adam. So we got Chris Matthews yelling, what's religion got to do with it? We've got George W. Bush dancing with people who chop off people's hands, legs, heads, etc. All right, now this next guy, I actually used to work for this guy. He's in charge of NASA at this moment, very right now. He knows who I am. Years ago, I did some great things for him, got some big, gigantic awards, and helped him get his promotions in the Marine Corps. He ended up being a two-star general in the Marine Corps, and he has the most missions of flying the space shuttle of any other astronaut in the history of the world. He's an extremely bright guy. But when you listen to him in this next clip, I think some of you will think, wow, 
that's interesting. Clip number 17. Clip number 17. The administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. Thank you very much. For Thank you agreeing. very much. Thanks so much yes. for allowing me to be here. It's, uh, it's exciting for me to be here. Well, it's fantastic having you on uh, Talk to Al Jazeera. I know it's very rude to ask this of a guest, but my first question to you is, why are you here in the region? Oh, I appreciate you asking the question. I'm here in the region. Uh, it's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo and uh, his speech there when uh, he gave what has now become known as uh, Obama's Cairo Initiative, where he announced that he really wanted to, this to be a new beginning of the relationship between uh, the United States and the Muslim world. Uh, when I became the NASA Administrator, or before I became the NASA Administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third, and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering, science, math, and engineering. I used to work for him, know him really well, when I became a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps after I was uh, enlisted in... Vietnam, when I was heavily involved in gathering human intelligence surrounded by the North Vietnamese Army working with the Viet Cong, he was the officer in charge of me who got me commissioned, came out to my parents' house, and when my wife saw that clip, she just shook her head, said, gee, what happened to Charlie? I have to agree. I'm going to close on this clip here because everything um, is based on this, and as you see, ISIS getting more and more crazy with their murdering, killing, all the things they're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Now, we're going to win. I know that. But we won World War II, and we won all these other things. It's not much fun going to war. I assure you, have been there and done that. We're going to win. We're going to win Romans 13.4. We're going to win by the blood of Jesus. We're going to win by Romans 13.4 and using the things that we have as Christians and having restrained responses militarily to these folks. I know that sounds funny to a lot of you who've never been in a battle, which I have multiple times, but actually we are, to a certain degree, restrained. The Muslims are not. Good example, under Islam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, the Muslim soldiers will grab a boy, a girl, a woman, put them in front of them as a shield because they know Americans or Israelis or UK won't shoot the kid. We'll do everything we can not to hurt that kid or woman. So they grab and they use these women and children as shields. However, we as American, even though we're not Christians anymore, we still have the morality of Christians, and we put our own bodies in front of women and children behind us. That is a huge difference. My book that I just wrote on uh, the sword of Jesus versus the sword of Muhammad contrasts that biblical battle planning that I did as an officer in the Marine Corps against the satanic battle planning of the Quran, Hadith, Sir, and Sunnah of what Muhammad did. It's obvious from all the clips I showed of Obama, GW, um, with John Brennan, with David Cameron, all these different leaders that they have bought into the lie, the demonic bewitched lie, that Islam is a religion of peace. That's absolutely false. Okay, so we're going to close off on this clip because this is how I do all my thinking based on as Islam grows 1% by each percent, they get more and more violent until after 10% of the ratio to the host nation, 100% of the Muslims join together to do what ISIS did, does. Clip number one. Clip number one. If you live in the West and are concerned with Islam and the Islamization of your country, this video has a message for you. What Islam is Not was published in the frontpagemagazine.com on April 21, 2008 and is an adaptation from a book written by Dr. Peter Hammond, Slavery, Terrorism and Islam. 
What Islam is not? Islam is not a religion, nor is it a cult. In its fullest form, it is a complete, total, 100% system of life. Islam has religious, legal, political, economic, social, and military components. The religious component is a beard for all of the other components. Islamization begins when there are sufficient Muslims in a country to agitate for their religious rights. When politically correct, tolerant, and culturally diverse societies agree to Muslim demands for their religious rights, some of the other components tend to creep in as well. Here's how it works. As long as the Muslim population remains around or under 2% in any given country, they will be, for the most part, regarded as a peace-loving minority and not as a threat to other citizens. This is the case in United States, Australia, Canada, China, Italy, and Norway. At 2 to 5%, they begin to convert from other ethnic minorities and disaffected groups, often with major recruiting from the jails and among street gangs. This is happening in Denmark, Germany, United Kingdom, Spain, and Thailand. From 5% on, they exercise an excessive influence in proportion to their percentage of the population. For example, they will push for the introduction of halal food, which is clean food by Islamic standards, thereby securing food preparation jobs for Muslims. They will increase pressure on supermarket chains to feature halal on their shelves, along with threats for failure to comply. This is occurring in France, Philippines, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Trinidad and Tobago. At this point, they will work to get the ruling government to allow them to rule themselves within their ghettos under Sharia, the Islamic law. The ultimate goal of the Islamists is to establish Sharia law over the entire world. When Muslims approach 10% of the population, they tend to increase lawlessness as a means of complaint about their conditions. In Paris, we are already seeing car burnings. Any non-Muslim action offends Islam and results in uprisings and threats, such as in Amsterdam and in other western cities, with opposition to Muhammad cartoons and films exposing Islam. Such tensions are seen daily, particularly in Muslim sections in Guyana, India, Israel, very good. You get the idea. We've shown that many, many times. When they get to 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, game's over. My prediction, my prophecy, uh, within 50 years maximum, maybe as soon as five years, maybe even one year, you're going to see battles as big as Gettysburg erupting all over the United States, Canada, France, United Kingdom. In fact, I've got thousands of people from all over the world, Europe, Italy, Asia, New Zealand, Australia, China, people are ready to fight back. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation, our way, and all of our ethics are based on what did Jesus do. God bless you all. Adieu. Oh